Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for tuning in for another session of ER Live for K-12 students and educators, um, brought to you by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. My name is Cassie, and I'm the Director for the Office of Education and Outreach, and a big part of my job is to bring our scientific research to different audiences. For those of you who are not familiar with the Earth Institute, our core mission is to foster a greater understanding of the science behind sustainability and the climate crisis and what we as global citizens can do. Experts that make up the Earth Institute include earth scientists, economists, uh, business and policy experts, and specialists in public health and law. The Institute is actually made up of more than two dozen or so research centers and several hundred people who work across many different disciplines at Columbia. Um, this is actually our second last EI Live K-12 session for uh, this, this semester. Um, and we have one more session on Monday. Um, and we have really had fun doing these. And uh, if you have any questions about watching some of our past sessions, um, please let me know. Uh, you can email me directly. We've done these since early April and we have a great collection of videos um, and they're on a very broad range of topics um, that our experts have uh, have covered. Um, so today we are going to hear from Laurel Zaima of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is the largest research center that is part of the Earth Institute. And Laurel is a program education program assistant at Lamont. She's also going to be joined by Margie Turin, who is the Director of Educational Field Programs at Lamont, and Margie will be answering questions throughout the, uh, throughout the session. So Laurel is going to help us uh, explore today how glaciers flow and demo how we make something called glacier goo, uh, which behaves very much like uh, real glaciers do in terms of its movement. Um, we're going to be using the Q&A box today, not the chat box. Um, and this is in the Q&A box is where you can type questions for our presenters about the presentation and also use it to answer questions um, that she may have for you. We'll be monitoring the chat box throughout, or sorry, the Q&A box throughout um, and do our best to get to all of your questions. Once the session's done, uh, we're going to share a link with everyone who's registered for the event so you can access a recording later on when it's posted to YouTube. And we'll also share additional resources um, as well as all the materials that you'll need um, to make Glacier Goo at home by, um, on your own. So let me know if you're having any uh, technical difficulties by emailing me directly. Um, without further ado, here's Laurel. Thank you, Cassie. Um, hi, everyone. So today we are going to be talking about glaciers. And perhaps many of you have never seen a glacier before or think of glaciers as these very remote uh, features on Earth because um, we might not live near a glacier. However, um, even if you've never seen a glacier, I'm going to take you to one right now, virtually. So this glacier is um, the Gilkey Glacier in the Juneau Ice Fields of Alaska. So this video was taken by one of our colleagues, um, Johnny Kingslake, he's a glaciologist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. He took this back in July. Um, and so I just wanted you guys to have a nice view of a glacier. Glacier is uh, land ice that is created from fallen snow that has been compressed over many, many years to create this large, thick ice mass. Um, and it is really interesting because when you think of ice, oftentimes pe people think of it as a solid. But in the case of uh, a glacier, it is so large and heavy that the weight, um, its own weight with the force of gravity actually causes it to flow. So it flows very, very slow, um, but you can see in this video uh, evidence of the glacier flowing from the highest point to the lowest point. Um, and so glaciers are amazing features. They only occupy 10% of the world's total land area. However, they hold about three fourths of the world's fresh water. So that is, um, it just reinforces how much water can be really tied up in these um, large ice masses on land. Um, and again, we're kind of talking about how these glaciers might be remote to us. And we might not think of them as um, having an impact on our daily lives because we don't live near a glacier. Um, however, glaciers are actually found on every continent except for Australia. So they are closer than you may think. 
Um, and I know many people think of glaciers only existing in Antarctica, Greenland, uh, Canada, Alaska, but um, they are more widespread, which might be surprising to some of you. Now glaciers, they vary in size. Some glaciers can be small, like the size of a football field, while other glaciers can be dozens to even hundreds of kilometers long. So when we're thinking about these two key terms, a glacier versus an ice sheet, um, you may have heard these terms before, and oftentimes maybe they have been used interchangeably, but there is a difference between them. So while glacier and an ice sheet, they're both types of land ice, an ice sheet is a large glacier. So it has to be uh, greater than 50 kilometers wide, which is about 20,000, 50,000 kilometers wide, sorry, which is about 20,000 miles. So that is huge. Um, so because a ice sheet is kind of like a large glacier, people often refer to ice sheets as continental glaciers. And we actually today have two ice sheets on Earth. Does anyone want to take a guess? And you can write it in the Q&A um, where those two ice sheets are found. If you are thinking it is um, one being Antarctica, you're absolutely right. North and South Pole, great, thank you so much. So the Antarctic ice sheet at the bottom of the world in the South Pole is the largest ice sheet that we have. And the second largest and our second only ice sheet that we have today is in Greenland. So that is in the Arctic at the top of the world. Um, we're gonna be talking about both today. So thank you so much. Um, and so the really important thing about glaciers is that they're super dynamic because they're always moving. And so it's important that glaciers stay in equilibrium to be stable. So if you can think about glaciers like a bank account, you have inputs and outputs. You want the inputs and outputs to be equal. Um, and so an input for a glacier would be snowfall. That snowfall is accumulating, compressing, and forming um, more stability of that glacier. Um, an output would be glacial melt, or the glacier that flows um, and could be like deposited into, into the ocean. So if you have those in equilibrium, you have a nice stable ice sheet. However, this equilibrium is often disturbed. So let's say you have more snowfall, um, then you'll see something called glacial advance. So the extent of the glacier will actually extend out. Um, and I'm just going to replay the last bits of this video. And um, if you have more melt, then you have snowfall, then you'll have something called glacial retreat, which means that the melting is happening faster than the ice of that glacier is flowing down. So it looks as if the glacier is retreating up. It doesn't mean that the glacier is all of a sudden flowing uphill, that would be impossible. Um, because of the force of gravity, but it does mean that that melt is happening faster, so it gives the appearance that the glacier is kind of retreating backwards. Um, awesome. So the last thing I wanted just to note, and you can see it beautifully in this image, is that you can see that the glacier has some blue areas, some white areas. Um, it's a really amazing phenomenon. So as the snow is falling and it's compressing, it can trap little air bubbles inside of the ice. And that um, can actually, those air bubbles, they reflect this bright white surface. So when we look at the glacier, it looks um, white. However, when ice is really old and really, really dense, so it's been compressing on itself for um, hundreds of years, you can see those air bubbles, they get pushed out. And as this really dense ice is forming, it absorbs a little bit of red light and then it reflects this bluish tint back to our eyes. So whenever you see this blue ice, it's really spectacular. It's telling you that this ice is old and dense and compressed. All right. Um, I also wanted to show everyone um, that these glaciers, they don't flow at the same velocities. So, so um, they're all very different. So this is what we're looking at right now is Antarctica. And scientists split Antarctica when we're speaking about it to Western Antarctica and Eastern Antarctica. And so this video is showing us how they flow at different speeds. So you can see here, the blue and purple is um, ice moving extremely fast versus um, ice moving a little bit slower in the interior of East Antarctica. Um, and so one of the most spectacular things about this video is that it really sh looks like a watershed. So it really shows how ice is flowing 
And um, just like a watershed where you have little tributaries feeding into the main Sem River, these little um, ice streams are feeding into main glaciers that are eventually deposited out into the ocean. And so I'm just gonna start at the beginning here. Um, the fastest moving glacier in the world, it's actually not in Antarctica, it's in Greenland. It's called um, Jakobshavn, uh, which is the Danish name, or Alilisat, which is the Greenlandic name. It's in Western Greenland, and it is moving at 113 feet per day. So that is a ton of ice that is just moving so quickly and depositing out into the ocean right off the west coast of Greenland in Disco Bay. So that's our fastest moving glacier. We also have a fast moving glacier called Pine Island Glacier. It's located right here in West Antarctica. Um, this glacier is moving up to 31 feet per day. So that's also extremely fast. Um, and so that is actually depositing right here in the Amundsen Sea. Um, in comparison to East and West Antarctica, and I'm gonna go back so I can show you, um, Bird Glacier, which is um, in East Antarctica right here, it is flowing at um, 9.5 feet per day. So a little bit slower. East Antarctica is um, older. And so it, the, the ice in this area is a little bit more stable. So it's flowing a little bit slower. Um, and then just for reference, these really slow orange coloration areas in the middle of East Antarctica, um, it's, there's something called the ice divide, which is the top point of the ice. That is flowing so slow in comparison to these really fast glaciers. It's only moving one centimeter per year. So you can see there's huge variability of glacial movement. And we do have a really fun activity where you can actually um, measure the speed of your glacier goo in comparison to these real glaciers. So that is a link that I can share at the end um, on our website. Um, and, and so the reason why scientists um, are so interested in looking at these really fast moving glaciers is because when you think of ice um, flowing into the ocean from land, it is contributing to sea level rise. So these really vulnerable glaciers that maybe are warming and moving faster than um, we would typically see have huge implications for sea level rise. And so that's threatening our cities and communities globally especially our coastal communities. Um, and so it's so important for us to look and study these polar regions to see the contribution of sea level rise from these fast moving glaciers. Um, okay, so that's a little introduction to glaciers. If there's any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, now I want to do a little glacial physics with you using glacier goo. So this is really easy to make at home if you have the materials. That's wonderful. Of course, during this time period, we're not encouraging anyone to go out and um, buy things if you feel uncomfortable. Um, but it's made of Elmer's glue, water, and borax. So you might have these things at home already. If so, that's great. Um, I can also share a how to make Glacier View video that will be linked in our website as well. Um, it's really simple. We also have some edible alternative methods using pudding and cornstarch or just marshmallow goo or marshmallows in the microwave that we can share as well. Um, but we have found that this to be a really great recipe um, that you can use at home. If you're a student, you could do it with your parents. If you're a teacher, you can do it with your students. Um, for these uh, activities, we are going to need a couple more materials. So first, um, you need a piece of paper that uh, you can print a scale. I don't have a printer. So instead, I just wrote on a piece of paper 10 centimeters from the start to the finish. And so that's really all you need. If you have a laminator, that would be great because this glacier goo is a little bit wet. So you don't want it to um, make the paper soggy. But I don't have a laminator. So we just put it in a Ziploc bag and that works perfect as well. So at home alternatives, um, there's a lot of different things you can use to make it easy on you. You want to create a ramp. So I'm actually using a laptop stand, but you can also use um, a book that's kind of like resting up on another stack of books. Um, anything works fine for that. We're also going to need um, a marker, some toothpicks, a couple props for these activities. And um, I'll tell you as we go along. 
But the first activity we want to look at is um, we're talking about gravity. So if you have um, this glacier goo and you kind of ball it up, I'm going to put it on a flat, completely flat surface as it's in this ball. I'm going to draw a circle. Tilt this down so you all can see. I draw a circle around this ball um, along the very edge. And so I want everyone to make a hypothesis and you can write it in the Q&A. Do you think this um, glacier goo is going to stay inside of this circle? Or do you think it's going to kind of mush out to the edges and why? And so this is the first um, Fergie bit activity that we wanna do with everyone. It's referring to gravity. So if you or your students don't know what gravity is, you can give them a little bit of background that gravity is the force of attraction between two objects. So if you're thinking about the earth as a huge, powerful um, object, it has a strong gravitational force that is pulling objects to it. So if you're thinking about um, anything rolling down a hill, the force of gravity is pulling it from the highest point to the lowest point. But what would happen if you have a object that's more malleable that's on a completely flat surface? Would it be impacted by gravity and how? And so I don't see, oh, so I do I see what we've answers. got, yeah, is that they think it's gonna go over the edges, but I don't think anybody's given us a hypothesis as to why. So maybe we could ask them to pop that piece in. Yes, please. If you think it's going to go over the edges, why do you think so? Hmm. And I already gave you a couple hints that it's related to gravity. No, because it's going to expand because gravity is pushing down on it because it is not as stable. Okay, so let's check back with our glacier goo. And I apologize, the glacier goo moves at a glacially slow pace. So, but as you guys can see, it did ex expand um, past that ring that we had drawn and you can see it's starting to flatten out. So that's something to keep in mind that gravity, of course, is playing on an object going from the highest to lowest point, but even if it's on a flat surface, um, that force of gravity is going to try and push it um, to go from that top surface and try and flatten it as much as possible. And so with something that is as malleable as glacier goo, it's able to do that. Um, and so you can see those same reactions happening with the glacier as well. That's our first Bergie bit activity. Our second one is going to be talking about friction. So now that you have this set up, we're actually going to be using the stand here. So I'll bring this a little closer. Um, what you want to do is kind of ball up the glacier goo above the start line. You can actually just create a little ball. And a fun tip about glacier goo is the colder it is, the slower it flows, the warmer it is, the faster it will flow. So I just warmed it up a little bit there. Put a ball at the top and then take a toothpick and put it right down the middle of this glacier goo. And it's actually, it's not flowing right now, it's just rolling. There we go. So take your toothpick here and stick it right down the middle. And um, we are going to look at something called basal friction. So basal means the bottom layer or the base of something. And of course, friction is the resistance when one surface um, is kind of rubbing on another. So it's creating um, a slowing effect of the moving object. And so the reason why we put that toothpick in at the bottom is because if you're thinking about this as the bottom, if the bottom of the glacier is moving faster, and this is the top of the hill and this is the bottom, if it's moving faster, then you'll see the toothpick start to slant upward. However, if you're seeing the bottom of the glacier moving slower, the toothpick will move down. Now, I want everyone to make a hypothesis. Do you think the toothpick is going to tilt forward, tilt up, or is it going to tilt down, and why? <laughs> and I gave you guys a couple hints um, about basal friction, and that's kind of the focus of this Bergie bit activity. 
All right, so we have one answer saying it will tilt up because the bottom is warmer. Why would it be warmer? Just curious. It would tilt up because you warmed it up. Oh, okay, sorry. Let me um, clarify. Um, warming up the glacier goo, um, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't override the force of friction. It would just make it flow as a whole. It would flow faster. Um, so you don't have to wait as long. Any other thoughts? I think we have some observations to make. Oh, one more. It will go down because while well, it will be sliding down because of the direction. I think the toothpick will tilt up due to the heat of the surface of the earth. Okay, we have a lot of interesting hypothesis. Let's see what happened here. So I'm actually going to unplug so we can be mobile. Um, you guys can see that the toothpick is actually facing downward. And so that's because if you think about basal friction, the friction of the base of this glacier, it is causing resistance, which means that the base of the glacier is going to be moving slower than the surface. So the toothpick then means that um, the surface up here is going to go faster, which means the toothpick will start to tilt down. If it was the opposite, we would see it tilt up. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions about basal friction? I think maybe one thing that might be interesting to clarify is that in a real glacier, um, there are sometimes places where the base is warmer and so that does accelerate flow and sounds as if perhaps some of you have read about that or learned about that already. Um, but this was, um, this is a very specific activity that's focused on the friction action rather than on the heat from the earth. Right. So in this activity, I don't have any heat source on the bottom of this platform, but thank you for clarifying. So the next activity we're gonna be doing, this is our birdie bit activity three. We are gonna be using um, any type of shape. I created a shape using tin foil, um, and we're going to be simulating how a glacier would respond if it was in a channel. So what you are going to do now is tape this um, shape this channel that you've created down to your um, platform. That one side, the other side, just in case. You're going to take your balled up glacier goo and you're going to put it right in this little, this is what this little bulbular shape is for, just to hold the glacier. And we are going to hypothesize how the glacier is going to respond to being within a channel. And so another hint for this one is that it does have to do with friction. Um, the way we are going to observe the changes on this activity are through um, using a marker. So any washable marker is perfect for this. You're gonna draw a straight line across the glacier and I'll do a couple. Perfectly straight. And the reason why you're going to do that is, and I'm going to let it do its thing. If you are hypothesizing that the edges of the glacier are moving faster than the middle, then it would create a frown. So if you're thinking the faster going down the sides in the middle, it's gonna create a frowny face from those lines that we just drew. However, if you're thinking that the edges of the glacier are gonna go slower than the middle, it's going to create a smiley face. So I would love everyone to write in the Q&A. Do you think it's going to create a smiley face or a frowny face? And why do you think that is? A smile because of the frictions on the sides. Anyone else? A smiley. <laughs> it might go out of the shape a little, but for the most part, it will make a smile. Yes, so. Um, if we had more, if we, I had also added this bit, bit of glacier goo, probably would have like seeped over the edges. <laughs> I love the smiley face. All right, let's see what's happening. You're absolutely right. It created a smile. And the reason for that is because of the friction imposed um, from the edges of this channel that we created. So the friction from here 
is slowing down the edges of the glacier while the middle of the glacier is able to flow a little faster, creating that smile. And so this is actually amazing. Um, you guys kind of saw uh, in a real life image of this in the video that I had shown, creating those bands. So you can kind of um, also look at real images of glaciers. They uh, show that similar shape as well. It's pretty beautiful. All right, great job. We are now on to our next activity and we're talking about drag. So everyone can, in your activities, you could take off, oops, aim this down so everyone can see, take off that little channel. And my object to create a drag, I'm just gonna use a matchstick, but you can do anything. You can use a Lego, you can use a block if you have one, um, anything that's small um, to represent an impeding object to ca uh, cause drag. So we're gonna tape your object, tape it at the starting line. Take it down pretty hard. And then we're going to take our glacier goo that's all balled up here, place it at the top of the start, and we are going to observe how the glacier responds to, make sure it doesn't fall there, how it responds to an item causing drag. So we're going to wait. Um, drag is another type of friction, which is um, caused when a force is acting opposite to a moving object. So Drag can happen with two types of fluids or it could happen with a solid and a fluid. And that's what's happening in our case. We have a solid that's impeding um, or imposing an opposite force on this moving glacier, which is considered our liquid. Um, so we want to make a hypothesis. Do you think it will flow quickly right over the object? Or do you think it's going to be impeded by this object and flow around the edges, maybe a little slower. Is drag basically friction? Yes, exactly. Drag is a type of friction. Mm -hmm. So how do we think this glacier is going to respond to this object imposing drag? What does normally mean? Um, and so this is something that happens in real life as well. Um, as the glacier is flowing, there might be um, an elevation change, a huge mound in the middle that um, the glacier has to respond to. Okay, let's see. I think it will go around it. It will go at normal speeds. I think it will go around. Okay. Amazing. Let's see. Let's see how it did. Um, so you're right. Um, it's definitely having to slow down and go around this object that's impeding its um, normal speed. So it actually would flow slower and have to kind of like divert around this object. So anything that's creating drag, just as you can think of drag as friction, it's going to slow down that moving object. I think it will sink because the, it will sink because of the drag and gravity and turn around it. Um, I'm not sure about the sink part, but it definitely goes around that object. Wonderful. Okay, and this is our last activity. Um, we are going to take off our item causing drag. I want you guys to be able to see what I'm doing. And then we're going to put a large item. So I'm going to use this toothpick box. Um, and we're going to be talking about a force. So for this, we're going to put it right at the start point, just like we did with our matchbook box. So this kind of seems like we're talking about drag, but we're gonna be talking about um, something a little bit different here because it's gonna be much bigger. And we are going to take our glacier goo, ball it up and put it at the start, right um, behind this object that's impeding, that's creating a force. And so with your students, or if you are a student, um, you can think about a force as this push or pull on an object. So that toothpick box is definitely impeding the um, glacier from, from flowing, right? It's, it's creating a force, like a back pressure on a glacier. And so just very quickly, it's already doing it. So I'm gonna show everyone. You can see that this normal flow is completely impeded. Um, this is super relevant because 
Um, we have something called ice shelves. Ice shelf is basically a floating platform of ice that's grounded on one end to land and the other end is kind of floating off um, into like the ocean. And so these ice shelves, they create that back pressure force to um, prevent glaciers from flowing really fast. It's, it's kind of slowing down the glacier. So I'm going to take off our force. Now that you saw this force is um, imposing on this object, I'm gonna take it off. Everyone write in the chat, how do you hypothesize the glacier is going to respond to let's say our ice shelf breaking off and all of a sudden um, letting this glacier flow? How's it gonna respond? It will flatten out. Flow. It will start going down and falling. Yep, so it's on a hill, so it will flow even faster um, than if it was flat. And it will go forward, right. And so remember, I had that um, force, our ice shelf, right at the start line. Now let's look at how fast this glacier is already flowing. So hopefully you guys can see, this is the start line here, and it's already flowed, um, wow, probably five centimeters. So it goes extremely fast. And that's um, a great demonstration to show the critical importance of ice shelves. These ice shelves, they create this back pressure. And so if scientists see vulnerability in an ice shelf, or if they see that an ice shelf is going to break off, then they're gonna be worried that that glacier is gonna start flowing um, extremely fast, which means more ice loss, and that glacier is going to be um, contributing more to sea level rise, and it's going to be a vulnerable glacier. So um, that is um, an amazing phenomenon that you can demonstrate with your students. Um, but I also encourage everyone to look up real photos of some of these uh, physics demonstrations that we just talked about um, in the Bergy Bits packet that I'm going to post online for everyone. It has all these activities outlined. So you can do them at home or in your classroom with real pictures of what these features look like in real life. So. Um, it's great to have students be able to do an activity and then relate it to what scientists are actually studying. Then what do the scientists do? Just sit there, not make some? Um, so our scientists, they are polar geophysicists. They're studying um, these really vulnerable areas such as East Antarctica, or sorry, West Antarctica um, and Greenland. And they're looking at and trying to measure how fast um, these very vulnerable glaciers are moving and how it's going to be impacting um, everyone in the future. And then they're also trying to model what, um, what could be happening in, in the future as well. So not just measuring the speeds now, but modeling and looking at um, all of the result, like the consequences and the resulting impacts of these really fast moving glaciers looking forward. There's also, um, I just wanna mention, there's also an activity write-up. Um, I can share this online as well. It's called um, the Ice Pod Project. Uh, it, I think it's called Bits and Bytes is the actual document, but the Ice Pod Project is um, a project led by a team of widely, uh, like a wide career range. So it's scientists and engineers, pilots, um, and they're all working to better, together to better understand these polar regions, so the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, and what they're doing is they're producing really highly detailed images um, looking at the ice sheets in both of these areas. So I can share that as well. It gives a little bit more information about uh, the work of these scientists. How many glaciers are in the world? I don't know that answer. Margie, do you know how many glaciers there are in the world? Um, there, there are hundreds of them, um, and sometimes they're bound into groups of a specific size. Um, and I don't, I, I don't think anybody has an actual finite number because of the way that they're defined. Some of them um, combine into larger glaciers, but they have individual names for individual prongs off of those glaciers. Um, some of them extend off of an ice sheet, and so uh, are they, should they be considered part of the ice sheet, or should they be given their own glacier name? So it's, uh, it's not a very de well-defined uh, kind of question to, to be able to answer. Sorry about that, but there are definitely hundreds of them. 
That's a good question. Um, someone asked, could you share how you got involved in this field? Also, could you speak with middle school age girls? What would you say? Um, so I personally came into the polar world in a little bit of a roundabout way. I actually, my background's actually marine biology. And if you have joined me for the other um, sessions of EI Live, we talked about microplastics, we talked about um, uh, the Hudson. And so um, I actually started working at Lamont as a, an educator. So taking some of this um, really complex science and teaching students, teachers, and the public about uh, the work that they're doing in a very fun, um, accessible way. And so um, my background is, is not glaciology, but by working with these scientists, um, I'm trying to share their research with everyone. Um, Margie's been working in this field for much longer than I have. Um, but what I would say to any middle school girl that is interested in STEM is to um, first, I, I really encourage everyone to look into a bunch of different uh, interests within the STEM field. So for me, I, I always loved the natural sciences. I love biology. Then I kind of focused in on marine science. Um, I dabbled in a lot of different areas of marine science. Um, until I found that I really love education. So to take as many opportunities, learning opportunities as you can, I think is so important. Um, and to always ask questions and never stop exploring this natural world, um, even if it is seemingly remote. So I personally have never seen a glacier before, but teaching about glaciers, watching videos about glaciers, learning about them um, through the different resources that we have online, um, it like started to grow a passion in teaching about it. So even if things seem a little bit uh, far removed, I think you can start to learn about it until you kind of figure out your passions and then you can keep pursuing them. Margie, did you wanna mention um, anything about your involvement in this field? Sure, um, I would love to. So I'll actually be, come online with a picture. Um, so I, <laughs> I've been um, working around glaciers and ice um, for probably 15 years. And um, I've been really fortunate to be part of uh, several campaigns in Greenland and Antarctica um, to be able to actually see these glaciers up close and personal. And it's really remarkable. They are, they are fascinating. And as Laurel said, you just fall in love with them. We won't all be able to do that. I mean, we know that. And in fact, it's probably better for our planet if we don't all run to the nearest glacier and take a look at it. Um, but they are an incredibly important piece of our Earth system. Um, they are really in, in, intimately connected to our climate control and managing our climate on Earth. Uh, and so really important to pay attention to. Um, I think there is so much room for young people, uh, school age girls, it's, it's a wide open field. There's so much to learn. There's so many different aspects of studying this field. So I would absolutely suggest people do, like Laurel said, just a little bit of looking around um, see what interests you and figure out which piece of it you might be interested in pursuing if it's what you're interested in. Because if you have a passion, you're going to really make a difference. Um, we also, and this just reminded me, we have um, these amazing write-ups of a lot of different career paths that work in the IcePod project. Um, they're personal interviews and they kind of share how they got into that pathway. We'd be happy to share them on the website for anyone, any student, young person, or adult that wants to read about how someone got into this field and the career path that they are a part of. Yeah, and we also have a really fun interactive uh, webpage, which we can put up there as a link, which focuses on two female scientists and their experiences in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's a, they worked in a very remote space in the interior of East Antarctica. Um, and it's a fun, it's directed at middle school age, so it would be a really appropriate resource. All right, we have another question. Which part of Antarctica has the most glaciers? Yeah, tricky question. So um, East Antarctica has a much, is much larger in size, so it has a much bigger rim around the edges, but it tends to be set up off of um, the ocean contact, and so it's up on higher land, uh, so it's not responding quite as much to changes in climate. 
whereas West Antarctica is, um, is lower, as I just mentioned, and it's also uh, ends in a peninsula, so there are a lot of edges, and it is responding much more quickly. So uh, I don't know that there's a specific count that's been done, but I would say that probably we would find West Antarctica has more glaciers than East Antarctica. And I just want to pop this up to show um, that West Antarctica definitely is more vulnerable and the speed that the glaciers are moving is much faster than East Antarctica, just as Margie was saying. And this, I think this video really just captures that. Perfect. <laughs> what is the biggest glacier in the world? So I think what so, we would say is the ice sheets are the biggest glaciers mm -hmm. in the world. And the biggest ice sheet would be the East Antarctic ice sheet. If you wanted to break it between east and west, it's certainly it's you know seven Greenlands would fit in an Antarctica. So uh, Greenland is large, but it's nothing like Antarctica. Sorry, Laurel, were you going to say? No, something? no, I, I was <laughs> going to say the exact same thing. Um, in that, don't forget that ice sheets are also referred to as continental glaciers. So um, it is a form of land ice. It is moving. It's just it has to be that that size. When can we make the goo? Can you can make you the goo whenever you want. Can you show them the video? Is that something oh, that, you yeah. have that you could just show? Because it, it's great. It just kind of walks through. It's very short and that will get you moving. That's a really good idea. Let me pull it up. So um, I was able to make this at home quickly. Um, I had access to these resources. Um, if you don't, the one thing that might be a little bit tricky is the borax. Not everyone has borax um, on hand. And so, thank you for your patience, just pulling up the video here. Um, and so if you are um, lacking in borax, you can always, um, you could order it online or you can use different um, edible materials. We have a, a, a couple that we pulled up that we can share as well. So I'll share this video. Laurel, maybe you want to talk them through while you're doing it. Oh, sure. Sorry, I thought there was music on your end as well. No. Um, yeah. Okay, so first we measured out some borax. Um, I just missed how much I added. Um, and then you add it to warm water to make it nice and dissolved. And um, then you add the three-fourths cup of water here. So I only have a quarter cup, so I did three times. Mix with one cup of Elmer's glue. And so this is just to um, make the Elmer's glue a little bit more um, liquidy before you add in the borax. So mixing the Elmer's glue and the water together, kind of weird at first, but then it kind of just makes it a little bit more viscous. <laughs> you can kind of see it's getting, there you go. Looks just like normal Elmer's glue now, just a little bit thinner. Um, then you add the borax, and the minute you add that water borax mixture, it starts to glop up kind of like what your end product is going to be. Um, yep, these globs are going to start forming, but you just keep mixing. So I would say you probably mix for a couple minutes until all that water is reacting with the glue, all the borax is reacting with the glue. Um, and then this is the end result. So. Some people actually call it slime. And I know there was a big trend of elementary age students that were creating slime just to play with. Um, but we use the same recipe and use it for glacier physics. So it works really well. Um, and then this is a video of glacier goo moving just as you saw sped up. So it's great. You can, we keep it white because it's white like a glacier, but you could also, if you were feeling um, ex excited about changing the colors, you could always use food coloring as well. So it's really easy to make. Um, I can quickly walk you through the other types of glacier goo as well. So um, I tested these out. They don't have the same um, flow properties that this glacier goo does, but um, it'd be worth testing. It'd be an interesting experiment. Um, one other way to make goo is taking marshmallows 
you pop it in the microwave for a little bit so it melts down into like marshmallow goo. And then you add powdered sugar until it starts to create this, um, it's a less sticky but still goo-like consistency. Um, I found it was a little bit more uh, bouncy, like it didn't flow as well. Um, the other one was uh, a mixture of pudding, water, and uh, cornstarch. And you need a lot of cornstarch for this one. That seems to have had a better consistency. However, um, I, I mixed, messed up. I messed it up, so it didn't work, <laughs> work for me. But um, if I were to do it again, I, I'm sure it would be great. What other properties can we measure? Density, viscosity, elasticity. So if you were to, if you wanted to do experiments with goo on its own, you can definitely test those things. Um, I think with the glacier, when talking about glacier physics, um, a lot of our activities that we did what was talking about the viscosity. So it's um, how, how fast it's moving, this kind of talking about the viscosity of the substance. Um, the other components, I think you'd be talking more about the glacier goo and not a glacier itself. So if you wanted to talk about um, ice density, there are some other activities that you can look at that um, I think are widely used in talking about, for example, sea ice. So I think there is a misconception um, that sea ice um, as would also cause sea level rise, um, but that's actually not true. So an experiment that you could do in looking at um, like the density of ice is having a glass of water, putting an ice cube in it, um, and having a student draw a line of where the water water line is and seeing or making a hypothesis and what would happen once that ice cube melts. Is the water gonna rise? Is it gonna stay the same? What, if for some reason, would it lower? Um, and then they can see that it stays the same because the amount of space that's displacing as an ice cube um, is the same amount of space it displaces as it melts because these ice, um, it, as it freezes, it expands. So, and then part of it is above the surface, right? So it's floating. Um, so that would be something to talk about with sea ice and comparing it to land ice, like a glacier. Um, but I think with glacier goo, the real property that relates to glacier physics is the way that it flows. Well, I have a quick question. Um, how long is the glacier goo good for once you make it? And like, how long, how do you, how would you store it? You know, if you made it today and wanted to use it um, tomorrow with a class or two, two or three days after, how long does it last? Great question. Um, okay, well first we store it in um, a Ziploc bag and it keeps for a pretty long time. I'm actually not sure, maybe Margie knows. Usually we um, retire our glacier goo once it gets a little, um, mucky and crummy because we often do these activities outdoors. We'll have um, bring glacier goo events to our open house at Lamont, which is outdoors, or community events that are outdoors, and we might get grass or hair or rocks in it, and then it gets kind of gross, so we throw it away. So I don't think I've ever thrown glacier goo away because it expired, but maybe Margie has. Um, well, I, th I think what you just said is the important point. The more it gets handled, even if it doesn't get dirty looking, the more it gets handled, um, the more that it starts to um, degrade a bit. And so it gets kind of liquidy. Um, the thing about the, the lovely thing about borax is it's a cleaning agent. And so um, in terms of different people handling it, it is constantly cleaning as it goes. So, you know, in terms of the, the sharing of germs, it's actually um, pretty, pretty positive in terms of that, in terms of being able to kind of keep that to a minimum. Um, if you keep it in the refrigerator in a Ziploc bag, it lasts for months. Uh, so it really does have the ability to last for quite a period of time, but it will start to pull apart if it's left out. Um, and I've seen that happen, but it's, it's a months. I mean, it's a very long lived kind of, um, yeah, long lived. <laughs> um, and it kind of reminded me, I had done this um, demonstration with this exact goo before, and it kind of has a pink tint because the marker I used before was red. Um, so the more you do this activity, the more different colors you use, it might start to change colors. It doesn't really impact the activity 
um, it will just not be a white representative glacier. That was in April, right, Laurel? Yeah. It, yeah, so it's, and so it's it pretty well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, I'm going to take this opportunity um, just to see if anybody else has any questions. Um, Margie and Laurel, any last sort of comments you have about, um, you know, where you might be able to find uh, more information about glaciers? Perhaps you want to talk a little bit about some of the other projects that you're doing that are both also in um, Antarctica and, and Greenland, and what are some of the uh, interesting sort of glaciers or ice sheets that you've looked at um, and, and studied and uh, if there's um, people who are curious um, more about the topic where can they go learn more about it? Um, great question. Uh, we have, as Margie mentioned, we have a website. Maybe Margie, do you mind putting the link in the chat? In the chat maybe um, that would be easy and it has a ton of activities a whole bunch that we didn't even talk about today. We really just focused on um, the bergy bits or the glacier goo activities. Um, but we have ones talking about sea level rise. We have um, an online exploration called Polar Explorer um, that we did in an Eli Live session a couple weeks ago now. Um, so there are tons of investigations that you can do around the polar regions. Um, we can also link these on the EI Live page for this session, um, along with activities that can just be pulled down, um, maybe like PDF documents and things. Um, so I, I thought maybe I'd just mention a couple of projects that um, we're involved in. So one is in Antarctica, um, right in that very vulnerable section of West Antarctica, and it's a, uh, Laurel mentioned Amundsen Sea, which is the area where we have the fastest changing glaciers. She mentioned Pine Island Glacier, but we have a sister glacier right beside it called Thwaites Glacier. That's part of an international collaboration right now um, that's studying its changes and they're focused on how much it will change and how fast it will change. It's what we would call a threshold glacier, which means that once it, it goes, and if and when it goes, which we at this point feel pretty pretty convinced it will be going, but probably not for many years at this point. But once it goes, it reaches way back into West Antarctica and will allow a lot of additional ice to flow, which is why it's called a threshold glacier. So that's one. And we've developed um, an exploration for Thwaites Glacier, which we can also provide for you, um, which is uh, an interactive opportunity to really understand what that glacier is all about and why it's so important. Um, and then there's another really fun project that we've done in Greenland called Snow on Ice, which um, took our scientists, our young scientists, and uh, turned them into superheroes with super skills to allow them to really explore what was going on with the Greenland ice sheet in the recent past. Um, and it looks at something called proxies, which is how we understand uh, what's happened in the past. So we can't directly measure, but we can use something else to measure, and that's our proxy data. And so that's a really fun um, set of activities that are all available. Um, they work for middle school and high school students, and uh, we're even going to think about how we can work with uh, elementary school students for them. So uh, those are a couple of really fun projects that we're about right now. Um, and one other one that we're doing, which is kind of fun, is working with communities in Greenland and uh, looking at how the ice sheet is affecting those waterfront communities. And something that's just a little bit unusual, and that is we think of sea level rise happening all around the world, but in fact, where these large ice sheets are, as the ice melts, uh, sea level will actually fall along the waterfront edges because of the change in gravitational attraction from the loss of ice, which is really kind of a wild thing to think about, but it will have a huge effect on all of the communities in those particular uh, waterfront areas. So very, very important. Um, uh, I, I see, just want to make a sh Yeah, I see. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, no, I just see there's an email that I, and I'm not quite sure what Martha 
Oh, oh, sorry. So that is the chat box, and I um, okay. had an issue copying and pasting that link that you shared, Margie, because oh. it was sent to me privately. And oh, so um, <laughs> I, no, no, I'm trying to share, and uh, that was the last other thing I had copied. Um, so we'll also share the the link. Uh, we're having some technological difficulties. Um, we'll also share the link with everybody who registered um, for the event. Um, but there is an open question. Okay. Yes. Do all glaciers have ice shelves? Ah, oh, do you mind if I take that one? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great question. And the answer is no. Um, so ice shelves are um, really ever present in Antarctica. Um, there are at least 45 really sizable ice shelves around Antarctica. But Greenland has a different design. So Greenland has fjords instead of, um, which is these long interior channels that move in where ice flows out. Whereas Antarctica is this almost round barrel shaped continent, if you think about it with, with that one hook on the end. And so the ice just rolls off the edges. And that's where, where you have these little little teeny dips around the perimeter and ice shelf as the ice flows, it'll stay attached in certain areas, but go afloat. So when we think about ice shelves, we really are talking about Antarctica. It's a great question. That is a really great question. And I wanted to just say one more plug that um, we are gonna be, those projects that Margie mentioned, the, um, the weights project, talking about how much, how fast, and the Snow on Ice project, we're gonna be doing um, professional development for teachers. So if you're a teacher and you're interested in that, EI Earth Institute is going to be doing um, professional developments and we're gonna be a part of them with this project. So if you are interested, um, I think you can contact uh, Cassie or Cassie's gonna provide more information um, in the future. Yep, definitely. Um, everyone has my email address um, because you have gotten the link for the session from me. So if you do have any follow up questions um, that you'd like to ask Laurel Margie or learn more about our um, some of our future um, virtual sessions for both students and educators, just um, shoot me an email. And um, so Margie and Laurel will um, will share the link to the I'll share the link to the recording. Um, and then what we'll also do is provide um, um, the link to the page with this recording plus additional resources um, once that is all set. So um, Margie and Laurel, um, thank you so much for, for taking this on and doing this great session. Um, and we'll also include all the um, ingredients for you to make your own do. Um, and uh, thank you for everybody for, for joining us. Um, and as I said, this is, we have one last session on Monday, June 29th. Um, it's actually looking at also um, so research at the polls as well, um, mostly Greenland, I believe, but also in Fiji, it's with Chris Zappa. Um, the session is called Climate Research with Flying Robots, uh, which is basically um, unmanned uh, aerial uh, vehicles. And he's using those um, to, do, to work with, uh, to do climate research. Um, and he's also doing some work with indigenous communities. And so it should be a great session. Um, so if you'd like to tune in for that and you haven't RSVP'd or want to learn more, uh, just send me a note. Um, otherwise, we'll see you um, hopefully on, on Monday or a future, um, a future session. So thank you again, Laurel and Margie, and hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye.